Diana grew up in Los Angeles, now in New Hampshire. But when she was growing up in New Hampshire, was uh, particularly fond of dance, ballet, especially a passion for flamenco dancing. And she had planned to study art and go into fashion design in college, and she took a creative writing course, and that changed things for her. And she decided to pursue her interest in poetry. Diana started poetry at age 15, and when she and her mom trekked out to an AMP and bought a typewriter back then. And that got her started. Diana is also a playwright. And she spent 10 years in San Francisco in theater, writing and producing plays. Uh, she's written quite a few. She founded a small theater there with other theater artists. She staged about eight of her plays. She spent the 60s and 70s trying to change the world. Now she's the author of five books of poetry. And as I mentioned, the founder and editor of Boston Poet Magazine with her husband, Marshall Harvey. And she's performed at a number of different kinds of poetry events, including Kerouac Festival, Squawk, Jeff Robinson's Poetry, Jazz, and a number of universities. And when I asked her for one thing that people might not normally know about her, Diana shared, I have four fish tanks, and I love clothes. And if you're a woman and come to one of my parties a little too dressed down, I may pull you upstairs and dress you up. <laughs> so I thought I'd just mention that. And please help me give a warm, good Saturday morning welcome to Diana Science. And this is called Mutant. Captain Bly had a peculiar gait. Twas his strident call that buried us in earth bare boards did rhyme in their ancient way. I, a Christian white boy, did find a gap from where some tenet was then released by an unhinged batard, where the earwig began to reason. Twas the ocean's part to play for him while we nursed our civility and watched our spirits sucked to no thing dear, not the countryside that swelled to blue in far off Isle England. And all that sank in the captain's sea did mock our very souls. A man did groan from a distance near while our captain gnawed his cheese when he put to deck that peculiar gate and the earth bare boards did weep in their ancient way. You can use what little you might have left to envision that island shore with a green sunset, a breath took in. And the kings were us, and just we felt. High a rhetoric gamble took no flint, and at last gave vent to our discontent. Breathtakingly, we moved as if freedom we were meant. When we took our captain down, I, that breadfruit's fate was sealed. I watched you shrink in a dead man's boat and wished all hell devil take you bligh ruthless. The servant rewarded in a sparse old whore, coming to grips with a liquid conclusion. I, a Christian white boy, did find a gap, did find his Ellis, didn't burn her down and quieted her suffering then began to slide in a greed like lies, while the natives pardoned our western ways till we stole from one his woman. Did we dream that our eyes were glass we lent to lesser men? So a blitzkrieg dawn would find slit throats at our simpleton chins, and the bounty was bankrupt. But history gave us a page when a fool is bred to foot the brunt when he falls away from a cry of dogs or a gaggle of London towners. This book um, is called An Ordinary Life Discussed. And, and you know, I decided one day after visiting my friend in Kentucky and seeing all her pictures, how beautiful her family was. And so I went home and I looked at my, I pulled down this, this suitcase and looked 
at the old pictures and realize how beautiful my family was when we were young. And as that, I wrote this homage to my family. And my mother wasn't terribly happy, <laughs> but, but, you know, if you're a writer, you, you know, I'm a writer and a, and a poet, and I always have to have that uh, s say to someone, well, everything you say to me might someday be in writing, so <laughs> friendship beware. This is the beginning. In the first notion, when the egg and second cell, everything teeters. Your diaphanous skin, whose waist thins, breaks in half and defines itself and breaks again. You press your face against the walls of mother's womb, reach for your sex. Yes, it is there. Suck your thumb, dream of the nipple, eyes glued with precambrian slime. The tug between the weightless spirit and the murky street evolves in the silent innocence that steps down into gravity, out of the lightness of the womb, into the imbroglio, beholds the demand that the soul become human and learns to say, I. We place upon that suckling thing renewed hope and portent and claim our progeny, its future, to circumvent and vivisect without third-person narrative, without Hollywood endings, with loose ends tied, without deus ex machina. It is you, the beloved, hand dipped in finger paint, crossing the poster board. Do we awaken with our earliest memory? I stand on a thriving lawn in the endless summer of remembering. My mother and I, my father and I, cup our hands around our maws and crowd call out, Rosemary, a sound that reaches up and pulls a fragrant, fragrant sprig. No, a young woman in white pajamas leans from a distant window. A princess in a tower waves. It is pure sensation and new as I am. My mother waves from the dock and I wave from the deck of that pristine ship embarked upon its maiden voyage. Because each event is new, one's lost in the detail of sensation in those earliest memories. We are spectators. We speak little. Others have the dialogue. And we are freed by innocence, which is not of having committed no crime, but the innocence of your crisp new dollar look without judgment. And how we view events is the most objective we shall ever be. And this is called an ordinary life discuss, and also uh, it's, there's the other half of it is the family myth, which really sold in my family. Everybody wanted to know what I said about them. <laughs> <laughs> Great way to sell your works. <clears throat> this is the Book of Eve, and this is probably my most, um, what's the word, subversive piece that I've written. And it's based upon the ancient uh, beliefs of, of mother, of the mother goddess and the, as the creator of the universe. And so I take the book of Eve and, and incorporate all the different, many different relig ancient religions and basically say that Eve created the universe and it was stolen by the male god, as is, as is the story in, in uh, our Greek myths and many other myths. So I'm going to do the same thing. And this is this is the part. It's told from the viewpoint of a young Guatemalan woman that I sort of patterned over Rigoberta Menchu, if anyone knows who she is. <clears throat> she won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1992. Um, and this is a part where where Eve gives Adam the apple, although a lot happens in this, you have to read the whole book, and there's a picture of it. Anyone can see that. And you notice that her hand is down, and his is up. So he's taking the apple. Men. <laughs> and this is from Adam's point of view. 
I cannot tell you why she called me to the tree, pity, curiosity, mischief, revenge, the sympathy that creeps in for one's captor. Mark my words, God's decree was nowhere in my thoughts. If you can envision the luminescent Eve holding that, holding the nutmeg scent in her tresses and the fruit of wisdom to my mouth, there is no doubt that I was meant to eat with she. Eating the fruit awoke my senses so that they joyously reported the tactile, the redolent banquet of hues so adamant grew my delight that a huge guffaw brought the chattering, bleeding, roaring, whistling, barking, howling, humming, snarling, chirping savannah, tundra, and tropics of beast to silence. This is when God knew something was amiss. I, who had barely stumbled through three words at a time, suddenly suddenly possessed a lithe wit. I laughed, and hearing that she laughed with me. God sent the wind to call up goose flesh, comb through the foliage, push the doe to shelter with fawn. We sampled the cold for the first time, and the cold sampled us. I took the largest leaves and finest vines and sewed together a cloak for Eve, a tunic for me, both garments equipped with stout pockets, my first invention. God was then upon us, his countenance sour, something dark murmured in the horizon. Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Eve held her mothering belly. God's visage deepened in solipsistic rage. I will kill you. I will start again. I swear I know what I did wrong. Eve took my hand. I felt her shiver. Her back no longer stooped, her eyes direct. She looked at God and said, I created you as I created nature. You made Adam in your self-same image, so he, like you, will challenge prudence, resist wisdom. You cannot alter what has passed, and no matter what your future scheme, you cannot change nature. Eat thee of thy own perfect tree, and contemplate our separate destiny. Come now, Adam. Paradise, paradise is not where man will thrive. So you have to read the rest of it to see what happens. And it goes all the way from the creation of the universe to, to, the, to um, Cain. All right. So <clears throat> maybe I should lighten up a little bit. <laughs> Let's talk about George Harrison. George Harrison. This actually goes to music, you know, so anyone that can, can accompany me would be, would be welcome. But it's a little short, so I won't, so I won't uh, ask for that. Usually I do do this to music. I recall the day they marched us in to the auditorium and ran a black and white film of four guys with a misspelled etymological name, George Harrison. I didn't have a clue. I wasn't very cool. But the girls who'd been kissed twice or more knew exactly what to do. They opened up their faces and screamed their bloody heads off. As you all sang, I want to hold your hand. Well, I was so amazed, I told my mama. She said they'd done that with Frank Sinatra. We were so innocent in 1963, it seemed that nobody misbehaved except President Kennedy, George Harrison. Yet I still preferred Bob Dylan and Buffalo Springfield until you boys came out with Eleanor Rigby. I knew that you had something to say. And to this day, George Harrison, I still play Abbey Road as I sing along in my car. So where are you, George Harrison? You're here, you're there, you're all around, and suddenly you're gone. But it, isn't it grand that you left us all these songs? And now you're hanging out with Jerry, Janice, and John. It looks like my contemporaries are going down the highway, lost amid the diners and the byways. 
But if I live to 101, I know I'll play your music because it's so much fun. George Harrison, George Harrison, George Harrison. <laughs> if it were not for your wife, I would change this obfuscated room a moment before your arrival into pellets of silver glass and unfolded dahlias. I would ink a yellow lay for you to wear home, the scent to confuse your sleep and make your morning ravenous for bakery bread and fat espresso. And no ambition but to pen a long rambling letter. I would weave with all the powers vested in my personal goddessness that you into my sarape, then hand you your picture contorted with rapture. What fun to watch you rummaging through your unsuspecting brain as you try to recall a moment about to occur. I would feed you wild conversation until you were perfectly ripe to catch montage cuts of tawny serpents under your shirt to hear erotic clauses tossed with fruit of the loom in Bali all together afloat on a melanin floor. If it were not for that wife of yours who expects you home tonight. That was before I met my husband. <laughs> Five minutes? Okay. So I shall read from the latest works. And this is, um, this is a, a very experimental book that will eventually be out. Uh, and and uh, I'm, you know, trying, always trying to explore language and, and um, you know, keep pushing the envelope. That's, that's my job. This is from a piece called um, the first naked night of Naked Spring. It's a long piece, and it's about all these different voices of us living in the time of war. This is from the soldier. I am still here, the protagonist, capable of progress. Join the Surreal Dreamer's blog. If I were to mention what happens when my eyes are open, your eyes would glue like feet of slime. The sky, the earth, the ears gasp, shaken even when not heard. No names, nobody haze, with all the light blowing open the eyelids at 14, 4700 in the baked afternoon. There is little cadence, cadence buddy, to think beyond a quick descent into self preservation. A simple request of, for muscle agenda, a voice reaches out, it is mine more beautiful than I could have wished. Give me time to earn the face of a plowed earth, nest decades sowing, softening to a planted kiss, losing color into memory until the last light snuff and they are free of my weight. Let me live stupid or smart, dip into the fruit, smear the mud, my face palm print, no frog, no tiger, let me live, let me live. The mother, why would I between my legs slide you out to send you into, dismant into dismembered cities? Return to me reworked, a gift of metal plates and sackcloth, and a well-dressed photograph to smile at us from the past. So for my last poem, I must have about two minutes. Um, I shall read. That's too long. I shall read. <laughs> too long. Cubicle men play at war. The wounds of soldiers thrust out, surrounded as we are by money and paranoia. Liars abound like a plague on the sea. Once you have seen it, no one can tell you it doesn't exist. The villagers and prostitutes speak in a kind of unison. Clinical study is called in the trenches, testing the software they call throwing gen grenades. This is a word poem. 
The children are chopped away, but the cubicle warriors know they will very likely survive tomorrow despite the relief. They are frightened. The cubicle men call the place where they hold their turgid meetings the war rooms. Boys with faces of honey and <clears throat> girls with minds of lithe burn their offerings and free face each other, and those wounded return to the dream, troll angels on a rolling belt. And not one has a single regret. They are clean, clear of spirit, and sweet to glom. See this pretty girl who sacrificed body poetry for her country. The first produced prototype becomes PP1, and the second PP2. What do the cubicle men say of this as they shake their snake dry in the john? In the morning, the cat badgers. As I catch the news, bathe my mask, fluff my quaff, paint my mug, till I smear their cat plates with eating. And the earth turns towing a footprint much bigger than Bigfoot. The war like revenge, the war that never ends. Thank you. Looking in the mirror, man is the only animal that has to look in the mirror to find out if there is someone in the animal. Cats don't have to look in the mirror, they know this. Dogs don't have to look in the mirror, they know this too. Man is the only animal that looks in the mirror to find out. Often man looks in the mirror because he can't remember what he discovered the last time he looked in the mirror. <laughs> eyes. The night has round eyes. They look into things like you and me. For looking, what have they to do? It is the end for the eyes. They live in shadow and light. Color is their tune. Every real thing passes into them. Their light enters from beyond. Outer and inner pay unto the eyes. The eyes arise in the sea. The sea passes through the eyes. The accomplishments of the eyes are many. Thereafter, eyes enter into seeing creatures. Every notion is partly composed of eyes. Every creature protects its eyes. Every creature notices eyes. All eyes are on the sexual one. All eyes are on the laughing one. Our next class will speak of the brain. <laughs> This poem is dedicated to my son, 19-year-old son Frankie, who lost his life 13 years ago. Um, he was in a tragic car accident. And um, there's another woman here who I've, I go, I belong to the Compassion of Friends. And it's just this type of stuff, it's sad to say, but it does inspire <laughs> to write and to get your feelings out because spiritually it's kind of where you need to be and it's helped me a lot. So. Um, Let's see. It's called On Christmas Eve. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. My heart has been plucked like a goose on Christmas Day. I pretend I'm okay on this Christmas Eve. I smile and joke with everyone, but really, a bad joke is on me. Cookies and the goodies get baked, like me, as I drink my wine on this Christmas Eve. The pain is unbearable as I remember my son this Christmas Eve. The presents are wrapped, the dinner is prepared. I pretend I don't care about the way things appear on this Christmas Eve. The many hugs and kisses, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year's are exchanged as I sit on the stairs trying not to feel the pain, feel pain on this Christmas Eve. Snow is falling gently down like angels hanging onto each other, other's wings. They are trying to catch my weary tears that drip ever so slowly down my cheeks on this Christmas Eve. I picked a piece from my daughter Courtney's writing when she was 10 years old 
for a school class at the time. She was going to throw it away recently, cleaning out her stuff. And this is why I ask her to not throw stuff away before I get a chance to look at it. I go through her stuff she was going to throw away before tossing. She is staying up at college for the weekend. Graduation is May 21st. Time warp. Already. It was a long time coming. She has stated at some point she would like to be an editor, creative writer, fantasy. Her 10-year-old sense of humor, the absurd, made me, now 58 years old, laugh. I don't remember seeing it when she wrote it. Think Charlie Chaplin and the era of silent movies. Courtney did not title it. I did. I call it Limes, Lights, Limelights, and Pantomimes. Once upon a time, there was a pantomime that built a light out of limes. He called it a limelight. Before he was able to debut it, someone stole it. When he found out it had been stolen by another pantomime, it caused a scandal. He accused the other pantomime of not acting like a professional. The other pantomime said he was going to keep the limelight because he was the one with the talent. That night, the first pantomime went to the home of the second pantomime to steal the limelight back. This was an abnormal thing to do. After he found the limelight, he wanted to teach the other pantomime a lesson. So he wrecked his house and left it in a pile of rubble. And that is all Courtney wrote. Just imagine the possibilities for the rest of the story. Charlie Chaplin, silent movie, era style. Lines, lights, limelights, and pantomimes. Thank you. Strawberry time